All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of the Center for Sports Communication and Media and the Moody College of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin, I'd like to welcome you to our event tonight, which is discussing this awesome book called Loving Sports When They Don't Love You Back, Dilemmas of the Modern Fan. All right, so uh, this has been a really good week for me because I've actually had an opportunity to talk to a couple different authors. The first one was last week we talked with uh, the Center and the Department of uh, Radio, Television, Film. Uh, we talked with uh, the author of Sporting Blackness, uh, Dr. Samantha Shepard, and that is available on our YouTube channel uh, for the Sports Center. And I'll also mention we have a uh, Twitter account, a Facebook account, and also an Instagram account. So there's lots of different ways you can follow us and find out the different things that we're doing. I don't remember if I already introduced myself. I believe that I did. I'm Jennifer McLaren. I'm a professor in the Department of Radio, Television, and Film. So now you know if you didn't already know. So now I'm going to introduce our guest, the author of this fantastic book. First up, we have Jessica Luther, who's a journalist whose work has appeared in Sports Illustrated, BuzzFeed, ESPN Magazine, the New York Times Magazine. She also co-hosts the fantastic Burn It All Down podcast. Uh, she's, if she's not, you know, already busy enough, I'll also say that she's a PhD candidate in physical culture and sport in the sports city program here at UT Austin. And we'd really just like to welcome Jessica. She is a fellow in the center. Um, so she's with us a lot and we're just really excited to be able to talk about your book today. So welcome, Jessica. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. All right. Next up. We have Kavitha Davison, who is a sports writer for The Athletic and hosts The Athletic podcast, The Lead. She has written for numerous venues, including ESPNW, Bloomberg, The Guardian, and Rolling Stone. Welcome, Kavitha. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry my headshot was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> no, not creepy at all. All right, so let's just dive right in. Uh, I just want to start with a sort of establishing for the folks that haven't had an opportunity to read the book yet, uh, just kind of give us an overview of why you wanted to write this particular book and what sort of co topics do you cover throughout the book? Um, well, so we, Jessica and I met over Twitter uh, is our origin story. And we always joke when we tell that, that Twitter is actually good for something, um, bringing together <laughs> communities of people who probably wouldn't have met otherwise. And, you know, the community of women sports fans and particularly women sports writers is very small, but also really tight knit. And it was probably around the time of the Super Bowl. You know, there are all of these really condescending pieces about, um, you know, geared toward women who the people putting out these pieces assume are just not sports fans. And they're always things like how to throw the ultimate Super Bowl party and, you know, how to talk to your boyfriend about football, how to survive a Super Bowl party, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it had just gotten to a point where we kept seeing pieces like this coming out that clearly were not for us and were for some idea of what the sports fan isn't, and a woman with being among that. And we were just so frustrated by it. And I think we just, we kind of bandied about this idea of a snarky response. Like what if we just did a whole book, like a how-to guide of, you know, how to survive sports when your boyfriend doesn't know anything about them or when people, <laughs> when men at the bar keep trying to mansplain, you know, at bats to you. Um, and thankfully it, it became this much more serious um, endeavor, thanks to our wonderful publisher and editor, Casey Cottrell um, at the University of Texas Press. Um, but yeah, and Jessica can probably talk to how the ideas of the things that we would cover um, evolved over time too. Yeah, it's hard to remember book writing as a long process, so it's hard to remember like the beginning of it, but the book is structured that each chapter is a different, issue within sport that a conscientious sports fan might grapple with at some point as a fan. And so there's, I think there's 14 chapters. We had, there were more, there was supposed to be more than that at some point and it got whittled down. And I think the way that it worked was that we just kind of created a master list of issues that Kavitha and I have faced as fans and things that we thought were probably the most important, the things we thought we could cover. I mean, one reason there's two of us uh, that authored this book is because we have different expertise and there are absolutely chapters in here that Kavitha spearheaded that I could never have written. Um, I could never have written them. Uh, she's much better at the economics of sport 
um, than I will ever be. So I, there's chapters on, um, okay, let me see. Now I have to remember our book, which is like a lot harder than you think it would be. There's chapters on brain trauma and um, doping and LGBTQ athletes and fans, uh, sports media and how white and male it is, uh, tax subsidies for stadiums, uh, baseball's free market, mega events, politics and sports, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Yeah, and you really are able to, to sort of grapple with a whole range of, of issues that come up. And it's like each chapter as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh yeah, and that, oh yeah, and that. There, there's a lot of material. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that you could have written on uh, had you more time and space for sure. Uh, so my next question is actually thinking about overall, why do we love sports or why do you love sports when it doesn't love you back? Mm -hmm. And I was sort of thinking about this question as, you know, I, I thought about it more metaphorically, like the three of us were sitting in a coffee shop in New York City, Sex in the City style, talking about this relationship. One of us was talking about a relationship that we had where the person was really treating us terribly, but we wanted to persist in the relationship. And then the other two friends were like, no, 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 don't do it. So why don't you just give up on sports? <laughs> That's the question, right? I think, I think the easiest answer and the most honest is that it's super fun. Mm -hmm. I like love watching sports. I find them to be, I just can get into, I love competitive stuff. I love seeing people go out there and win and, and the struggles. Like I like all those narratives about overcoming things in order to succeed. Uh, and, but I'm just the kind of person I'll watch anything when people are competing and I don't, I can't tell you why that is like what it is in me. Uh, I mean, I can make fun of ESPN and I do for putting cornhole on television, but like, <laughs> I would watch it like so <laughs> I think on part of it is that it is deeply fun a lot of the time but like, you just can't enjoy what you're watching um I think you know I was an athlete growing up I mean I was a middle school basketball player like I don't want to like inflate my um athletic career there or anything but I think playing sports was really important to me when I was young and so that's carried over into me as a fan um when I'm older and you know, I think one thing about it, it's hard. Like it doesn't always love us back. And that's really true. We were a whole book on it. At the same time, I just don't want to give up on it. I don't want to give it over to the people who uh, aren't making it as inclusive as I want it to be. Like it won't ever get any better. And it's unfair, frankly, that it's not a more inclusive space. And um, so I can't, I just can't let it go. I like, I, yeah, I do. I just like it too much. I think it's also, you know, we talk a lot about identity and community in the book. We interviewed um, this great uh, psychologist, uh, Dr. Susan K. Whitbourne, who talked about, you know, think about when your fandoms are formed. And they're usually early in childhood when your sense of self and your identity is formed. And often they have to do with your family, you know, the whole like dad took me to a ball game kind of thing or they have to do with, you know, the city that you grew up in. And for me, my sports fandom is very much tied to my identity as a New Yorker. Um, and, and, you know, those things are so hard to let go of, especially when it comes to sports, because I think that they do happen earlier overall than other fandoms that we develop. Um, one of my colleagues at The Athletic, Nate Taylor, who covers the Kansas City Chiefs, actually just wrote this really beautiful piece today about, you know, he's been covering the Chiefs for several years now. He had never covered a game with his dad sitting next to him because obviously there's COVID going on and he's not in the stadium. And he wrote about the experience of bonding with his father. And obviously, you know, Nate grew up in Kansas City, so he, he grew up a Chiefs fan. He has that in him. But the experience of covering it with his dad sitting next to him and the bond that that reinforced, you know, those are really difficult things to break. And I don't think we're suggesting anybody do that. As far as community, you know, I talked about my New Yorkiness kind of being wrapped into my sports fandom. I think it's also a way for us to find common ground with people that, you know, we don't necessarily share a lot of common ground with. For me, you know, I was very young when I went to my first ever Yankee game, was, had never been to a live sporting event. 
my parents are from India, so they're not huge, you know, sports fans. And I was like the scholarship kid at a very rich and very white private school on the Upper West Side. And me ending up loving sports was a good way for me to communicate with and um, just exist with my my classmates who didn't come from backgrounds that were similar to mine. I think that that can be a really common experience. Um, and we remember that, we remember that feeling, remember those feelings of community when your team wins the World Series or wins a championship and what it's like to celebrate together. And I feel like those are the feelings that we try to recapture every time a season restarts. Yeah, and it also then would speak to sort of this desire that much of your book talks about is to try to give more people access to that because there's a lot of processes that are really trying to limit who gets to watch sports and who counts as a legitimate fan and who, which identities get to play sports and, and to sort of consume these you know, various teams that they're a part of. Um, and that's really one of the through lines that, that really comes through, I think, very strongly is that you know, out of this love that you're talking about, you know, there are, you know, when you love something, you also want to make it better. And I think that that is really sort of clear. A part of making it better is giving more people access to it and breaking down a lot of those barriers that we see. Um, well, and along those lines as well, I think, you know, we, we've done some of these book events in Canada and Australia, and we're lucky to have done that. But a lot of this, so I, I do think that the book is universal in many ways, but there is something very uniquely American about how sports are used to, I don't want to say assimilate us, but to, you know, bring all of our different groups in this like very unique kind of country and setup that we have together. I always, you know, one of the first classes that I ever took that actually explored sports in an academic way taught me about how Irish and Italian immigrants were very much othered in the early 20th century and baseball was how they became part of mainstream American culture. And we're, you know, we can see that with different, with different groups along the way. And when we restrict that access, we restrict what, you know, full American life is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm curious also sort of when you, because you're not writing for 100% all fans. There is a, a particular fan that gets interpolated within this book. Um, for example, I can't imagine you're really writing for the people that are, think that sports should be apolitical. Um, so I'm curious, like when you were writing this, what what is the type of fan that you have in mind or the types of fans that could be more than one? That's a great question. I think us, I mean, I did think, I was thinking of Kavitha and I, whenever I was writing and people like us who do think that sports are political and um, care about identity and power and all these things that, that we touch on in the book. At the same time, I do want to push back a little bit. I mean, I don't think... I don't know how many people who believe stick to sports, like in the idea of stick to sports, that, they, that sports are apolitical are going to read this book. But I also hope that they do, uh, even if they disagree with stuff that we've written, I, I do want to engage those people because ultimately uh, that is how we end up changing these things, whether or not they will read the book. I mean, the title is pretty uh, clear on <laughs> what the book is doing. But yeah, it was really important to us part of what we wanted out of this book was to say to other fans that are like us, like, we're here too. Like, we see you, we hope you feel seen by this book. We hope that you recognize that there are actually a lot of us that, that deal with these issues, that have trouble with them, that are making all kinds of decisions about what type of sports we consume and why. And there's a, the book was originally titled, titled How to Love Sports When They Don't Love You Back. Uh, and we dropped that how to when we realized how difficult it is to prescribe uh, the ways that you can respond to these things, but there is some how in this book and that people see the kind of actions that other fans are taking in order to try to mitigate all these tensions that they feel as fans. So, I mean, I, I do think it's mainly for that kind of fan. Um, the one who reads the title of the book and is like, oh yes, I know exactly. That's me. Uh, but I do hope that there are some people who are willing to read it and if we can just like plant some little baby seeds in their brains that they can't, un they can't unlearn, um, that would be great too. I also think, I don't know if I particularly had a specific image of a fan in mind when, when we were writing this book, but 
I definitely was aware, especially if you, if you look at our chapter on media representation, which I think exists as kind of an existential like microcosm for the whole book. It's like the whole book's purpose of being is that sports media and the stories and the narratives around sports are told by white men and are geared toward white men. And I think that we wanted to write a book that wasn't limited in, in that audience and in that readership. So I don't know if necessarily, you know, we had this like extremely colorful rainbow of readers in mind, but we definitely had this like one very rigid set of sports fan um, that every other book or every other piece, like the pieces we talked about at the beginning that inspired the book um, are geared toward and we wanted to expand well beyond that. Yeah, and I would definitely say for me personally reading it, I felt I felt that it was definitely speaking to me in ways that some of that other types of sports writing that you've mentioned doesn't necessarily because it, it brings up a lot of the issues that I identify in my own work and that I, that I honestly that I grapple with all the time, not only as a fan, but as an academic consuming this in order to critique it or to think about it, think through it. I mean, it, it really serves a lot of a similar purpose to what you're trying to do in this book, but I even grapple with that, you know, and, and where my limits are and because I'm constantly wondering, you know, I'm participating within these systems and I wonder, you know, what's too far for me? Where will I draw the line on things that I will not no longer continue to participate in as a fan or as an academic researching it? For example, I'm writing a book or I just finished writing a book on the UFC that's coming out in April. Yay, Yay congratulations. Thank I can't you. wait. I can't yeah, wait. Shameless, <laughs> shameless plug here. <laughs> it's called Fighting Visibility, Sports Media and Female Athletes in the UFC. And I've said that as soon as I finished the book, I was going to get rid of my UFC Fight Pass membership and I was going to stop watching the UFC. And then I started writing another paper and I was like, okay, well, after this paper is done, I'm going to stop <laughs> watching the UFC because it, a lot of the issues that you bring up in this book are definitely prevalent within this particular fandom that I'm a part of. And so I'm curious for you all, like, do you have lines? You know, are there things that you're like, okay, this is this thing I can't, I can't deal with. I'm, I'm no longer going to support X because it's too far. Hmm. That's so interesting thinking of it, especially as doing academic work. Like, are you making like making something legitimate like are you are you lending it legitimacy at the same time that you're critiquing it and oh that's that's such an interesting ethical question yeah i absolutely have lines um my easiest answer to this is that i was born to be a college football fan i have the generational fandom both of my parents with the florida state it's the only school i applied to for university because i wanted to watch florida state football games and i went there and then we were great when I was there and I used to set my fall schedule by the FSU football schedule. And I don't know, I don't know, five years ago, maybe I, my fandom really started to get stressed. I don't watch college football anymore. Uh, and that's a whole host of reasons, a huge one, which is probably not a surprise to anyone that knows my career is I write a lot about gendered violence in college football and anytime, not anytime, but when you know how the sausage is made, when you know the sort of harm that, that's a part of a system, sometimes that's just very difficult to let go of. I'm also like just a really Debbie Downer kind of person to watch college football with because I have this like just like terrible encyclopedia of people. <laughs> like, uh, oh, I remember that guy from the time that he, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I also have all kinds of issues with brain trauma. I have issues with the fact that we don't pay players, uh, the fact that we don't have socialized healthcare in this country and therefore the stuff that they are doing on the field will linger in their lives. And yet there is not a system set up to help them. And so I have drawn that line in my life, but there's plenty of stuff that I watch. And as I'm watching it, uh, I very like, I love tennis so much. I actually hate so much of the French open is right now. Cause I'm too busy in this in September to watch morning tennis. Uh, I was like, oh, I need that back in the summer, but, um, we have a whole chapter on tennis in the book and all the issues within it. I'm, I'm very aware of them. And I just kind of while I'm watching pretend that I don't know anything about it. Um, like I'll just pick that back up when it's over, right? Like when I'm done watching. So um, I do have hard, I do have a hard line with one sport, but it took a lot. It took a lot 
for me to get there. Uh, and I, yeah, I find it hard to give up sports, but um, it, apparently it's possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm luckier and maybe I have a similar, I don't know, excuse to you, Jen, in that like I work in sports every day. Um, so I just have a professional obligation to continue to watch mm-hmm. these games. Um, but football is the one that's probably the hardest for me. Um, and it's the one that where my fandom, my personal fandom has probably decreased the most. It's difficult for me to watch a football game. Um, I don't celebrate the big hits the way that I used to. Um, it's, you know, especially on the college level, like Jessica said, just knowing the economics about it. And for me not having, I didn't go to a college that had anywhere near like the college sports culture that most other universities have. Um, so I just don't have that personal connection to it also. So it is also probably easier for me, um, to try to ignore college football, um, as much as I can outside of my professional capacity. But I would say the, the hardest line that I draw isn't for individual games or individual or individual sports, but for individual players, um, especially when it comes to players who have been accused of gendered violence. You know, I like Jessica am that Debbie Downer. Like, I'll try not to bring it up, but um, you're going to see my face when Aroldis Chapman comes into pitch for the Yankees, and it's not going to be a happy one. Um, and you know, I think that. A lot of the times also I'll just be watching with people who won't be aware that this player has been accused of something and Jessica can absolutely speak to this. Um, and, and you kind of, you have that moment where you're like, should I tell them? Like, sh- should I, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I explain why I'm rooting for this person to be sacked right now? <laughs> that kind of thing. So I think that's where, that's where I probably draw my firmest line. Um, and then, you know, there, there are definitely certain instances where um, the organization around an event. We talk a lot about the Olympics and we both love the Olympics. We love the Olympics so much, but it's so hard. I think, especially when they were in Sochi, it's, it was so hard to watch because the Olympics also play up everything about the setting and about the place where they're being held. And, and, um, with Sochi and with Rio, you know, there, there were some problematic things about the places they were being held outside of even just the problematic aspects of planning an Olympics. Um, so I think that those are always really hard. It's hard for me to pay attention to those kind of human interest scene setting, scene setting pieces when I, I know too much about the scene. Yeah. That's interesting, Kavitha, because like part of what the entire point of hosting, right, is to is that NBC or whatever, BBC, whatever the uh, broadcast is, is going to do those things that are like, this place is wonderful. Like that's part of the reason uh, that they do it. And yeah, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, that they're destroying that place, but, but hiding it and how they cover it. And it's, yeah, really difficult. Yeah, they show some beautiful cultural scene and then they, you know, hide the fact that there's sewage water leaking into the, yeah, into the there ocean. Were, there, were no, there were no shots of the favelas during No, the Carmelo, Rio. Anthony had to go into the favelas right. for there to be any actual coverage of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have a related question and I, 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 I'll have to apologize a little bit because I'm using, I, I kind of feel like now that we're talking, this book is sort of like a self-help book for fans. <laughs> Good. Like me. <laughs> we hope we help. <laughs> and uh, one of the questions, another question that I grapple with, and this again stems from my research on women in the UFC. And I have in the end of my book, uh, in my coda, it's called On Love and Violence. And basically the point of the, that last chapter is, is to think about how all of the love for MMA on the part of the fighters fuels them to it, to work in conditions that are detrimental to them when it comes to sort of physical health, of course, when it comes to the fact that they're independent contractors and they don't get paid, you know, the vast majority of them don't get paid enough to make a living or to break even similarly to, to the lower ring of, of tennis players that you talk about in the book, all of those things, but it's, it's, they are willing to put up with it because they love it. And in you know, in our fandom too, part of our fandom fuels not only the good things that we love about sports, but that love also can be used to fuel the things that we don't like. So I wonder if that's something that you think about or that you've grappled with. And again, it's a big esoteric question. I'll say the biggest place where that, for me, the biggest place where that kind of the 
weaponization of fan love um, shows up in the book is in the stadium sh subsidy chapter because the threat to leave, the threat of a team to leave is hits you at your core as a fan. And for 20 years, you know, LA existed just so NFL teams could threat could threaten to move there and get more money out of their local municipalities. And you would interview fans from those cities. And in some cases, those teams actually ended up leaving, like with the Chargers. But um, in most of those cases, they didn't. And the threat was largely empty. But you would interview these fans and they would say, I know that they're taking millions of dollars and these are my taxpayer dollars. And I don't, you know, and, and we're cutting the school budgets and all kinds of things that probably deserve this money more. But I cannot, I cannot stand the prospect of losing my team. So in that one issue, you get the dilemma of knowing that this is a hoax or this is a strategy. You're being manipulated, but you can't help but, you know, veer toward the manipulated side. Um, so that's, that's definitely where I think that love is um, exploited in, in large ways across, across all of sports, frankly. Yeah. I think women's sports, we feel this a lot as fans of women's sports as well. Um, Kavitha and I are sitting here in our shirts about women's sports right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I think it was really obvious during the summer when um, the NWSL, like I didn't watch a lot of the NWSL in part because I didn't have the CBS All Access at the time, but also I felt super conflicted as a fan. Like, do I don't think they should be doing this, but also if the women are going to do this, I feel an obligation to support them because they get so little support in general. Uh, I ended up buying CBS All Access towards the end of the tournament in order to watch some of the games and also Picard, but mainly to watch some of the games and when the WNBA started in the wobble, I had the same conflict of like, do I participate as a fan in this thing that I think is not a good idea, both for the health and safety of all the people involved in putting this on, but also the message that it's sending to a country that is not taking this seriously and that lots of people are dying in because of. And it's great that the bubbles have worked as well as they have, uh, but like, what do we do? Like, it's so unfair to us as fans that on the one hand, we don't want to support this, that we think they're making bad choices as far as health and safety. On the other hand, women's sports are shafted so often that like you feel this moral obligation. I feel, as I'm saying I here, I feel a moral obligation to support them when they do go out there to play. And I don't have, even now, I don't have a resolution to that feeling. I, I watched the US Open, like I was giddy almost to watch the US Open when it was taking place. But should I? <laughs> like, should I have watched that? Like, I, I, I just still don't know that answer. And I, I'm not sure how we relieve that tension. In part, I think one of the things that we're getting at here is that so much of what we write about in the book are some huge systemic issues within sport, but also just within our society. And we're sitting here as like three individual people talking about like, what can we as three individual people do within these giant, you know, long historical, deeply rooted systems. And on some level, there's only so much you can do that, that sucks, that feeling. I feel like a lot of us are feeling <laughs> that feeling in lots of ways right now. Uh, the impotence of being just a single person within these terrible systems. Uh, and so, I, I think that tension will always exist between the individual and the system that they want to change. And how much are you, like, we're, like I was saying before, how much are you adding legitimacy to it at the same time that you need it to be different than it is? Yeah. And so you started talking about um, sort of what's happening currently. And I think this book really can, even though it was written before the pandemic started and before this new wave of athlete activism around you know, state violence and, and police brutality before that all cropped up. Um, so I'm curious, what are some other ways that this book can help us read what's currently happening in this, you know, beyond the issues that you've just talked about, Jess, but, you know, what are some other ways that we can think about, you know, either athlete activism or some of these other health and safety issues that we're thinking about? Hmm. Well, we, we always laugh whenever someone says this to us about the book, because we had a, like, we 
panic. 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 <laughs> the, the day that the day after Rudy Gobert um, tested positive for COVID and they shut down the NBA, it was like, I think it was five days before the book was going to print, which is, that's for anyone who doesn't know, like that's the point when you literally cannot change your book. And we were freaking out that this book would be irrelevant, that it would hit at the wrong time, that it would be deeply insensitive based on wherever we would be in September, that there would be no sports, which is laughable now because there are too many sports. <laughs> there are too many sports right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. So what else can we draw? I think one thing Kavitha and I have been talking about a lot, uh, and I think COVID has really brought this forward. And this is in, I think this is in the book. Like we, we definitely discuss this in the book. I just, I'm not sure how mm, in your face about it we are in the book, but that athletes are laborers. And I think in the US we're particularly bad about talking about labor. You know, we like labor history ends in the early 20th century in the way that we teach that history. We don't have a good sense um, as a society of how to talk about laborers. You know, we, as a, we tend, the people who tell the stories tend to align themselves with ownership over labor. Uh, but I do feel like of all the things that have happened around COVID and athletics, around the activism, the wildcat strikes, so there's even with the way that, I mean, we've gone back and forth and it's been a real roller coaster around college athletes and them speaking up and the choices that they've made, but it has really forced to the front that the reality that these are people who are laboring, they are taking on massive health risks that a lot of us are not willing to do, right, in our, in our lives. Um, like I'm in a, my own little bubble. Um, no one in my house leaves it. So we're, we're all here. We're not willing to go out into the world to do our jobs. Uh, we don't have to, which we're lucky for that. But um, I do think that that has I'm interested to see how much that will change things moving forward. Again, talking about huge systems like owners and people who run big institutions like universities, they will want everything to go back the way that it was. They're always pushing for us not to view these people as workers. Uh, but I do kind of wonder if COVID and all of the stuff after George Floyd's, Floyd's murder, like all the things that have come up within athletics in the last few months, if we can actually walk that back, if we're going to see a narrative shift in how we think about these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thinking, thinking about athletes as, as workers is, is a through line, I think, to most of our chapters, um, whether it's brain trauma, obviously, um, college athletes not getting paid, that kind of thing, but also thinking about them as humans. Um, we've talked about this a lot as, um, you know, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and, and all of the athlete activism that, that we've seen in the last few months, the idea that not only are these people, are these players no. doing a job and they should be paid accordingly and, and everything like that. I'm sorry if that's me. <laughs> I was just going, I don't think I have that. I know, I was like, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I've got three screens open and I don't know where it is. <laughs> try to figure it out. I'm sorry. No worries. No worries. Um, but, you know, not only are they, are, are they workers, they should be paid accordingly. They should have all kinds of safety um, protections. I think I fixed it and everything like that. Um, but that you just, just because you're going to an arena to do your job doesn't mean you stop being a black man or woman in America. Like that it's just not possible for them to turn that off and they shouldn't have to. And being public figures as they are, and often being some of, you know, having the largest platforms and having some of, you know, the most powerful positions, the most front facing positions of people from, you know, parts of their community that never get you know, camera time and things like that, they're going to use that. They have every right to use that to shed light on the injustices that exist in this country. And we kind of have to accept that. <laughs> um, I don't think that there's any reversal from that realization. I don't think there's a way to actually put the toothpaste back in the tube, which is a great thing. Um, so, you know, recognizing just how three-dimensional these people that we see on TV and that accomplish these superhuman feats. You know, I'm always talking about how one of one of the reasons we love sports is because sports is mythology. It's mythology in real time, right? You're seeing these completely human people accomplishing these superhuman things out of sheer, you know, God-given 
like physical talent and incredibly hard work. But at the same time, they are still humans. They are not gods. And we have to give them space to explore that and explore what that means in the context of their working relationships. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you talked about this, this moment where you were like, oh man, you know, our book is coming out in the middle of all of this. How is it going to address this? Is there any sort of specific thing that you would write, if you were writing another chapter, if, the, if, if, if University of Texas Press was like, yes, we will allow another chapter in there. What, what might you write about? Hmm. What might be a series of things? You don't have to pick one. Hmm. That's interesting. I think, I mean, obviously there's just things we want to update. <laughs> that yeah. was actually really hard in, in real time to just sit on your book as the world is changing. There's an entire, we haven't even mentioned this. There's an entire, entire chapter on native mascots framed around the Washington NFL team with the, I believe it ends with us saying, this will never change. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, and of course, I would love to update the chapter on athlete activism. And well, it's it's a chapter on athlete activism, but it's actually a chapter on politics in sport. And I think last night we heard at the debate someone say, "I brought back football." Um, you know, like sport has is a very political thing, specifically right now, in a way that's deeply interesting and would be useful. Um, but I don't know. Is there something? specific from COVID. I mean, I do think one of the things that we were good at with the book is we hit a lot of stuff that has just been revealed. Like it's just been very stark. I mean, there's things that I wish were in the book that aren't like, I wish we had something on disabled athletes. Um, we could certainly have something on Latinx or Hispanic athletes and like what they deal with um, that you know, we have stuff on racism, but not the particular um, hurdles that people are for that next athletes and coaches are forced to jump over. Um, I don't know, Kavitha, what is your answer to this? I think there could be, there could be an actual just COVID chapter, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've thought this a lot, like everything that we've been discussing in the last six months about the responsibility of bringing sports back is, is, is this dilemma in, in one extreme example, right? I, I, I'll always say that, you know, I was, I'm from New York, I'm in New York now, but I was in LA when New York was hit hardest with the first wave of COVID. And it felt very much like New Yorkers were on an island. And I would have these Zooms every week with all of my friend groups and, and it, it was extremely dire. And when things started to get a little bit better in New York, unfortunately, it was getting worse in the rest of the country. It was also around the time that we were actually starting to have real conversations about how baseball would come back and not in a bubble. And that seemed really irresponsible. And I would talk to my friends in New York who had lived through months of hell, months of sirens never stopping and knowing what that meant and knowing, you know, and seeing, you know, EMT coming into your building and knowing what that meant for your neighbor. Um, and I would have these conversations with them and they would say, you know, we understand probably more than anyone else in the country, at least right now, the effects of this virus, the consequences of opening things too quickly, of the consequences of this virus spreading even more than it has now. But man, I want to watch a ball game. Like I want some return to normalcy. I want something to make me feel like, you know, like things are like the world isn't ending. And and that's the dilemma. Like, like what do you say to that? You know, that person knows that it's probably irresponsible to bring sports back, but that's that's a real emotion. That's a that's a completely valid response. So I think that COVID in itself could just be a chapter. I think that instead of additional chapters in light of COVID, we could probably write a whole like just updates to every chapter. We could extend them by like forty pages each. Um, <laughs> that's when it comes to. I hear another book coming. I know. On. I feel stressed. <laughs> I feel it's a little stressed talking about this. <laughs> Not just the native mascot updates, but um, you know, nil rights in co in college sports actually being granted. Um, the way yeah. activism has evolved just in the last three four months has been incredible to watch. All of that. I will also say one of the chapters that we did not that did not make it into the book was um, how to attend a NASCAR race when there are Confederate flags flying in the stands, which also would have needed uh -huh. to be updated. <laughs> and the other chapter that might have. Some more, um, especially now with the taxes, the New York Times reporting on taxes. So, yes. so the, the chapter <laughs> that we did not 
that we did not work on that probably would have gotten us into some more legal trouble than was necessary was how to um, how to deal with golf or how to attend a golf uh, event at a Donald Trump owned golf resort. Uh -huh. um, and there are all kinds of tax implications there. It I was is. also you know, specifically thinking about what it's like to be a Latinx worker at a place mm -hmm. like Doral. Um, Woody Johnson, the you know owner of the Jets is also the UK ambassador mm -hmm. and has been tasked with getting um, the British Open back at Turnberry, which is the, um, the Scotland based a uh, golf course that Donald Trump owns that they mysteriously dropped from the British Open rotation as soon as he took ownership. So um, I think there would be some things to do there. I would like to, I would, I, I think it would have to be November 4th or later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a dangerous exercise because as Kavitha was talking, I was thinking, man, we could have written about mental health. And I feel like one of the most interesting things that it's, I mean, the way that we have seen athletes and some leagues talk about mental health over the last five years has been radical in a lot of ways that I think are wonderful. Um, these bubbles, though, have been fascinating, um, mentally exhausting for these athletes. And they have been talking about it. I think I haven't read it, but apparently Emily Kaplan, uh, and oh, what's the guy's the other guy's name at ESPN. They wrote a piece about the NHL bubble right. and like, a, yes, thank you, Greg Wachinski. And like a big part of that was about the mental strain on these athletes and like what on the other side of this, like even talking to people who aren't in bubbles, but are still performing football players, namely even MLB players, um, what this is like, the stress of being out there and being asked to perform um, during a global pandemic when we don't have any good grasp on it. And then of course, anything around sort of the deep mental stress of the racial injustice that we continue to see throughout this country. I, I think that could really be an interesting chapter, but we are, oh, the idea of writing another, but we just wrote this book. <laughs> <laughs> One more out you there. can take a breath and then <laughs> out there. this is recorded you can come back to it yeah later. i was just thinking and that yeah take notes <laughs> you one already more, have like a table there, of though. contents ready to go so I, you're good I think that one more that would probably be in the in a mental health aspect would also be a work-life balance and i'm thinking particularly that um covid has forced athletes to make decisions around prioritizing not only their own health, but their family's health over the sport that they're playing. And then the addendum to that is, you know, players like Mike Trout, for example, had to make decisions about whether they would be there for the birth of their child if they weren't going to be allowed to leave a bubble. Um, and, and the whole paternity leave conversation has been gross for a while, but, um, but has especially come to the fore with, with COVID and you, you know, the other side of that is you've got all these really heartwarming videos of like little kids entering the NBA bubble and running to daddy after not seeing him after all the months. wobble uh, babies, all the wobble all the babies. WNBA babies that has been delightful, mm -hmm. but also is a real reminder to us that these are parents, mothers, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. working moms, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, there's plenty there, plenty more. <laughs> you don't have to think about it continually, but. We're, we'll, we'll be waiting for another book for sure. Uh, so I want to go ahead and have the participants who are watching, if you have questions, go ahead and start putting those into the Q&A and I'll take some of those. Um, somebody just mentioned another topic, chapter to consider, athletes from, <laughs> so we have a whole list for you, athletes from countries like Iran, Iraq, Russia, China, uh, ran executing wrestlers, yes. you know, obviously if you take this book internationally, you've got a whole other. Yeah. I just read today that like one of the, in Belarus, they just um, arrested the most vocal athlete who's been protesting with all the upheaval around the presidential election there. And mm -hmm. that person is now in prison. So yeah, there's mm -hmm. so many international stories that would definitely be worthy of. I mean, Eric was this sort of thing. And you know, Cantor, uh, who is stateside mm -hmm. now, I mean, there's, there is a lot to do there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. All right, while we wait for other questions, so participants, please definitely type in there if there's something that you want to talk about. But I have another one if I don't get something soon. And that is, let's talk about, well, 
briefly about Maria Taylor. And uh. I have a question related to that. So for, for folks who may be listening that don't know, um, Maria Taylor debuted as a sideline reporter um, for Monday Night Football and sports radio hosts decided to call her out on her appearance in a very inappropriate way, which is a very obviously very common thing that female reporters in sports deal with is they're constantly critiqued for their appearance. And then someone else, and I'm not, I'm not naming their names because I just don't think that they need more airtime, but someone else decided to um, basically say that she only got that job because of her looks and then called out, you know, Katie Nolan for similar things. And my question related to that is how do you work in sports when they don't love you back? Mm. <laughs> Older knows a lot. I mean, it's hard. I've, I like, you know, the stuff directed at Maria Taylor and Katie Nolan is not directed at us, but like, you feel it. I mean, this, I, it's hard not to internalize that and wonder what your colleagues think of you and why you get the opportunities that you do. And I also find it really difficult when other men remain silent, when men say those kind of disparaging things, um, there's like jokes about this, but only kind of jokes that like we keep lists of like who has our backs and who don't. Um, but I don't, I, I think sometimes you just, this is a hard question because sometimes it's really hard and I'm a white woman in this work. So Kavitha is going to have like a whole other level that, that she's dealing with. But um, as someone who loves women's sports, I find it difficult a lot of the time to get that stuff published. That can just be a real fight and it's hard not to feel again to take that personally like they're giving you all the excuses for why they're not going to run this piece on women and it's hard not to think like that they just don't like women a lot um and that you're in that group uh so maybe they're trying to tell you about people don't care about women in baseball but you're like hmm i mean i think we have a chapter in the book about the WNBA sort of standing in for like all of women's sports and Amani McGee Stafford, a WNBA player, we interviewed her in that chapter. And she says like, basically for her, people who don't like women's sports don't like women. And like, that's um, how she feels about it. So I don't actually have a good answer to this. I, I actually just think a lot of the time it's really difficult and you have women friends in sports. I mean, I co-host with four other women, Kavitha and I, I think found our found each other through women on Twitter who love sports and like grab, I mean, we kind of, you gravitate toward, towards those people in part because you care about the same stuff, but also to commiserate. I think there's a lot of commiserating that goes on behind the scenes. I was just talking to another woman today and I interviewed her and we finished the interview. And then the last five, 10 minutes when we were on the Zoom was like talking about how hard it's been because she's gotten a lot of attention and uh, from the same kind of people uh, that you were mentioning before, and it's been a really rough go for her in the last uh, month. And like, that's just what you do. That's part of how you uh, manage it is you just feel sad together. And then that sort of bolsters you, <laughs> which mm -hmm. is sounds really not great, but like that. Yeah. You do what you can, what you can control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's just really hard. Like Jessica said, I don't think that there is um, a survival path it's just to survive. You find, you find your communities, you find your support systems. Um, you know, and, and like Jessica said, I think that it is different for all of us, but there's so many overlapping and similar experiences. Um, I've never been accused of getting my job for my looks, but I have been accused of getting my job because of affirmative action. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And I will also say that it's, it's also really, there's so much less rope for women in this industry. You know, you make a mistake and it's, it's the end of it. You feel like it's the end of your career, but you also just feel like it's the end of your credibility. I remember early in, in my show, we had pulled like a 14 hour day. We were putting together an episode about the Knicks and, and the, and the Knicks new coaching situation after they fired David Fisdale. Um, and uh, and, you know, I was just, I was exhausted and we had to scrap the episode that we had like 10 hours mm. into making it, which was a whole, mm. whole thing. So we're, you know, trying to, you know, 
piece something together. And I, and you know, the, the coach who took over for David Fisdale was Mike Miller, who was the assistant coach of the Knicks at the time. I did a whole thing about Mike Miller, the former player who was a former NBA player. And I didn't get killed for it. People pointed out the mistake the next day when the, when the, um, when the episode published, but I was mortified and more than, you know, the embarrassment. And I am always really hard on myself when I make mistakes. I, I knew I had this in the back of my mind that nobody will ever take me seriously as an authority about basketball ever again, because everyone is always waiting when you're a woman for that one thing, that one justification for the why proof. you be here, the proof. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and men are just given more leeway to make those kinds of mistakes. So I think in some ways, the, the challenges that we have in in continuing to fight for our existence in this space as women who work in this space are very similar to, you know, women fans who continue to have to prove that they also belong in this space. Um, and I don't think that there's really a, a good way out of it. I, I will say on a personal note from for the Katie Nolan stuff, I don't actually know Maria Taylor, but she is very good at what she does. She's so I think good. She's so mm-hmm. good. I think that what she was wearing was fly as shit was was really like amazing sorry <laughs> i realized i was on an academic car <laughs> that's okay <laughs> um and like i want to know where she bought it because i want to wear that too um but katie i've known katie for years and i remember doing katie's show um several years ago when she was doing garbage time on fox and we we had a very serious discussion about brain trauma in college football and you know, Katie's show, especially then, you know, Katie's, Katie's fun. She's funny. She's an entertainer. She's extremely smart. Um, and I think all of that comes across. She doesn't always do really serious topics. That's just not her show. And that's okay. And I remember after we had done that episode, one of, we, we kept getting these comments from people who kept saying, Katie, why don't you do more serious stuff like this, more hard hitting stuff like this. And she said, I don't do serious stuff because I'm not a serious person and that's okay. And this idea, what, what that whole thing said to me was, it was this idea that there's only so many spots for women in the industry. You can't, you can't have a Katie and a Kavitha exist in the, in, in the industry together, even though we do wildly different things, right? Um, and Katie has always been an advocate for the idea that you know, if you've got 30 men doing 30 different types of shows and then you've got another 20 doing exactly the same show, by the way, you should absolutely be able to have women in this industry of all stripes using every piece of talent, every skill at their disposal and every aspect of their personality um, toward broadening what sports media looks like. And when you bring down a Katie or a Maria, you're flying in the face of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we didn't even talk about like the actual abuse that we get from doing this work, which is like its own thing. So like you, you definitely see it within sports media, but then like learning how to deal with the abuse is part of the job too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, a whole other layer of tax that, you know, obviously women and women of color in particular have to deal with in in this business. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a question from Mike Butterworth, who's the director of the center, and he is asking about the U.S. Open coverage and says, assuming that you watched it, um, what was your response to the persistent references to be per players as moms? Um, There was something uncomfortable about how much this shaped the coverage, but he's saying he can't really articulate what was so uncomfortable about that. So did you feel that same level of discomfort while watching? What did you think about that? Yeah. Uh, on our podcast, Lindsay Gibbs talked about this at one point. She called it fetishizing motherhood. And I think that's what it is. Like it, it I find this difficult. I'm a mom. Uh, my kid's almost 12 now, but like um, I was doing, tr- this sounds way more amazing than it actually was, but I was doing triathlons before he was born. And nine months after he was born, I did my final triathlon ever. And I did it in part just to show that I could, because we do get so many messages that this particular thing is going to ruin our body, that it will never be the same, that you won't be able to do the same sort of stuff afterwards, that you're sacrificing something um, physical in order to have a child. And so I feel that. And I celebrate mom athletes, especially because it is pretty rare. Like it was amazing on some level that's what it was um, 
the semifinals, no, or the quarterfinals, there were three women that were moms. Um, but I think it was too much introducing them as the mothers of their children. I mean, Azarenka was really clear when asked about this, that like when she's on the court, she's not thinking of herself as a mom. She's a tennis player and she's just trying to play tennis and she did it incredibly well. I was really excited to see her back. Uh, she is so fun, I love her. Um, but like, that's not what they're thinking about when they're out on the court. So it's weird to push this narrative so hard. Um, and of course you never, it's pretty rare that you get the other side of it. Um, I mean, when Federer's twins come out, then we get to see them and they're adorable and that's lovely. Um, but you don't get this sort of the same kind of they've overcome narrative. So I do feel like it was a fetishization. And I'm just, again, I'm just like parroting Lindsay here because she's so good on this, but she was like, really what they should have been talking about was all the ways in which the WTA needs to do better to support this so that more women can be mm -hmm. moms and come back. And like the fact that Parankova was able to come back was because Azarenka and Williams pushed all these changes when they, at the top of the, you know, at the very top of the game, they pushed in order to change the rules to make it more friendly. And Parankova showed what can happen when those uh, rules are, um, are better for people who leave to have children. And so like that, that should be the discussion that we're having about how do we change the system in which that for many, 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 many decades has made it harder. And now why is it easier? Um, and it's because of the activism that, that Azarenka and Williams did when they returned and it took all that power that they had in order for that to happen. So that, that would have been a better discussion and, and less gross, I think. This is one of those examples of what you get when the people making these broadcasting decisions are not women. Um, because you can see how the WNBA has celebrated its motherhood in a way that doesn't feel gross, right? No, and you're right. Pops, yes. It mm -hmm. pops up a lot. Like, and, and like, like Jessica says, I love watching the videos of the kids at the pool and, and, you know, they cut into that during games and it's great. And it's a celebration of them as mothers, but it's not, um, fetishization is a good word. The way that it, it came across with the U.S. Open broadcast, it felt like it was, you know, you know, like those performance art pieces where it's just like someone sitting in a room naked with like a glass thing around them. That's what it always felt like when they were pointing to these women being mothers. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really know how to articulate the mm. difference between how it was, ex how it's been executed. I think one is frequency, but it's also just framing, right? Um, you know, the idea that like Jessica said, Azarenka said, I'm not thinking about this when I am on the court. My primary role in this capacity is not as mother. And the idea that that's still, the way that it was framed just came across as, you know, we are covering these women in their professional capacities. Again, these women are workers and and their role as mother is, is taking primacy over the, the reason that they're here in the first place. And the WNBA just does this so much better than I think anybody else could. And I think part of the reason is because the people who are doing that coverage and who are announcing those games are women and are mothers. You know, it's also interesting to think like the US Open, the ESPN coverage was not great around Naomi Osaka and what she was doing around racial justice. Uh, they, they tried, there was some big failures around it. And I think the mom narrative is so easy and we see this so much in sports. Like I have a lot of feelings about redemption narratives in sports. And I think that they're just such an easy way to draw a picture and bring the audience in or whatever. Um, and I feel like the US Open really showed us that like women as mothers is like way more comfortable than thinking of like women as activists. Um, and so they, they just, man, they just <laughs> onto that. They just <laughs> latched right on and then they couldn't let go. Um, which just says, as Kavitha said, so much about the people who are making the decisions about what stories they wanted to tell. And ESPN is actually usually pretty good at their US Open broadcast. I don't know, maybe if it was a function of the fact that it's a smaller crew, they couldn't send as many people to the actual Open, that kind of thing. Like ESPN does consistently have way better gender representation, especially for US Open coverage than any other outlet does. But it's one of the great things about tennis. You can yeah. turn on the TV and there's a bunch of women on it, which right. is mm -hmm. not always true. And Chris McKendrick is wonderful. Let's props to her while we're here. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of had it. I mean, I had a very similar response to both, you know, your point about Osaka and how they were like 
So you're talking about an issue that's really important to you. What is that? Okay, enough of that. Next thing. And then, you know, just this hammering on the, the motherhood piece. And it, it was like, you know, there was this desire to, to almost to be trendy somehow, to connect with, you know, those current issues, but just a really poor execution. Like it wanted to be more progressive than it could do. And so it yeah. ended up just falling very flat in terms of, it was insincere, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. So, oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we are about out of time. I just want to check and make sure, yes, we got to a few questions. So thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you for this wonderful book available everywhere. All the usual suspects carry it. Um, and, you know, it's really fantastic. And I, I think it's, you know, I can see that several of the chapters I've already like earmarked for, for classes that I teach. Um, so I'll, I'll be using it for some time because I think my, my students in particular are really going to resonate with it. Um, so I just, I, I want to thank you for writing this and, and for joining us today and, and I look forward to book number two. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jen. Thanks thank for so this. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, we're all done. Thanks, guys. That was great. Boy, yeah, that was awesome. You. Nice to see your faces. Yeah. yeah, maybe one day in person soon since we're in the same city. <laughs> I know, I know. No, I don't leave my no, house. No, no. <laughs> I don't leave my house either. <laughs> I mean, I walked I was dog. like, you could go into the center to, to do this recording. I was like, no, I'm not leaving my house. <laughs> I'm staying right here. No. Nice hey, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Mike. Oh, good. Mike. Uh, hi, Jessica. Hi, Kavitha. Hi. Thank you both so very, very much. And Jen, thank you very much for your excellent hosting. Yes, my Chris, pleasure. Chris, thanks for setting it up. Good, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was great. Yeah, it yeah, was. I wish we had more time. That was terrific. Mm -hmm. That was such a good point, Kavitha, about the WNBA and how they do motherhood. I'm going to steal yeah. that from you. I mean, I always feel bad. I feel like there are uh, people, like men especially, are always going to ask, like, you know, this felt wrong, but I don't really know why. And it's sometimes really hard to say exactly why, but you can point to how it's done properly. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a very good point. Because mm -hmm. they are really good at it. And I know so much about the babies of the of the Wubble. And it's, it's everywhere. So it's not even like really a frequency thing, but I just, I want more of the babies of the Wubble. Mm -hmm. like, I love, what is it? Dwana Bonner's twins call her mama, mama Dwana? Mama Dwana. Mama Wana. Mama mama Wana. Wana. Huh? Oh, I love that. That's well, I think so it's just great. so much more natural. It, it just doesn't seem contrived in any sort of way or, or like remarkable in a way that it, it shouldn't be. I mean, because the, the points that you were making about, you know, your triathlons just, I think, you know, are good in that it's just, like there is a, a pressure to prove that you can. <laughs> yeah. And we've seen it like, you know, that a lot of that pressure is placed on Serena, but it's also very natural. Like your life doesn't end once you become a mother. And so right. like, why would it, why would it need to be something that's remarked on? But there, it was like such a desire to be progressive and connect with the current moment. And yeah. And a really, yeah, that's funny. Thing. Cause like that scene when Olympia was in the stands and then Alexis went and got her after like oh, all of that, that was that. perfect <laughs> that because was it was great. just, it just organically happened and was sweet and was like, this is the way it goes. And it, mm -hmm. it was sort of the superimposing on mm -hmm. top of, on top of it. Um, yeah. Cause even when Alzarenka took her son to watch someone play, I can't remember who was in it and she was being all cuddly and cute. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I like mm -hmm. seeing I, in the same way that I liked them showing the athletes eating like mm -hmm. in the suites while they were watching. Mm -hmm. Like I enjoyed that, like seeing that part of them too. So. Well, and even like uh, if you go back to like Carrie Walsh and Misty Mae Trainer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when Carrie had her kid and then came back and won another, I don't know how many they've won, like won another Olympic gold medal. Um, and ES, uh, not ESPN, NBC didn't beat you over the head with it, but it is this incredible, like, just yeah. feat that she accomplished, especially at her sport. Like, beach volleyball is not 
easy on on the body <laughs> and on the no. parts of the body that get um, that, that go through with, with the yeah. <laughs> um, so you know again like I wish that I had a more like I had more specific things to point to about why that was okay and like what happened on the U.S. Open broadcast was just too much I think they were just you know to your point Jen they were just trying too hard to be woke like <laughs> yeah they needed storylines I mean I think they were really trying to find the right story. Mm -hmm. Like when Djokovic went out, Aaron, my husband was like, oh no, we're going to hear about this every single match from here on out. Because like, <laughs> they need the story. They need the drama. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, I was so, my dog right at the end, he like moved and I thought he was going to turn the light out. <laughs> but his paw like landed on the thing. I was like, oh no. Mm. He's funny. Adventures and pandemic book talks. Yes. Well, congratulations on your book. That's very that exciting. That is really exciting. I'm yeah. so, like, I, I try to follow UFC. I would never call myself an expert, but mm -hmm. so many of my friends are huge UFC fans, and in particular, mm -hmm. UFC women fans. Yeah, uh -huh, um, which is really interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I talk a lot about labor in the book, too, so I'm glad. I was oh, glad good. to see that come up so much in, in y'all's book, because that's really what it ends up being is, like, you know, the title, Fighting Visibility, is about yeah, women are more visible in combat sports than ever before, but <laughs> it's to their detriment, really, because of this really exploitative system. Right. So. And one of, one of the segments, and I can't remember if it was this month's Real Sports or last month's, but it was about, um, you know, cutting weight to meet weight and, and mm -hmm. really like awful nutrition. Um, yeah. Stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of physical things, you know, obviously the, the obvious like brain trauma and injury and there is, you know, weight cutting. Also, just dehydration leads to, like, can lead to greater effects from from brain injury, like oh, concussion, being dehydrated and getting a concussion. I mean, they rehydrate before the fight, but their body is taking like a huge toll, um, and they don't have health insurance. Right. They right. have insurance for the fight itself. So if something happens in the fight itself, which causes a lot of fighters who don't make very much money it causes them to go into fights injured because that's the only way they can get it covered. Yeah. Injured. Just like tennis. That's just, yeah, that is exactly. Yeah. That it mirrors it. It mirrors mm -hmm. it a lot. And then you look at tennis and Rolex is sponsoring tennis, the U S open. And you look at all the sponsorships that the UFC has and how much money in a multi-billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. um, and it's made out off of contract labor and, and you know, the superstars that's make some money, but, but most, the vast majority of, of fighters don't. So. We'll have to have you on the podcast, this. Jen. Yeah, I put you on my market for the press. I yeah, put yeah, yeah. Make on. sure. I was like, I want to be on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure, for sure. So yeah, we'll connect closer to them about that for sure. Yay! All Yay. right, I have to go make dinner. It's sure. Right, sure, Finger it's night. Sure, yeah. Finger it's oh, night. Oh, fun. But, yeah. Enjoy good that. night. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good night. Thanks again. All right, so y'all. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. See y'all later. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Chris. Bye, bye.